All right. All We've right. got a fun, fun pillar to dive into. So relationship is one of the pillars in the class customer success framework. Mm -hmm. And if your experience is anything like mine, you probably get asked about the questions that fall under this pillar more than anything else. Is that true? Absolutely. One question in particular. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to hit that one first. So there are two questions in the relationship pillar. And this relationship pillar, just to just maybe to give some background on, on what it means before we got, get into the questions, um, we have another pillar called culture that's really a, a measure of um, how well a vendor manages expectations, keeps promises, and, and, and meets the expectations of providers, both implicitly and explicitly. The relationship questions are more about the individual tactical or strategic in some cases interactions you have um, the conversations the emails the phone calls less than it is around the sort of big picture how do you approach the customer absolutely so the first question I, I know you've been dying to talk about this I love this one executive involvement so do you want to talk a little bit about why you get so many questions about this question yes so when uh, our vendors see this, they're like, so does this mean that C-levels are communicating with our customers? Does this mean that there's enough high-level executive contact? And the answer is no. What this means is at class, um, executive involvement means there is someone at the organization, at any level of the organization, who's empowered to take care of problems. And as a CSM, this is an area I'm really passionate about and is really important. I love that it is that you're you're clarifying that it it is not just about the C level because if you think about the difference between small emerging companies where you mm -hmm. might have five or six clients, it probably is somebody with a C level title who might be talking to you because of your size. You might be talking to the CEO every single time for support issues, roadmap issues, yes, everything. Yes, absolutely. But if we're talking about the EMR vendors, or you think about um, in the human capital management space, some of the vendors there have thousands of sites. There's no way that they can get C levels and to talk to all of those folks. No, absolutely. This is so important when we're dealing with scaling and as a company grows. If you have your executives handling all of these issues, and if there aren't other people empowered to help take care of this, when you hit a certain capacity threshold, your service levels are not going to be able to be sustained. I like that you tied that back to growth. Um, that's actually, when, when I work with vendors that are going from small startups to large companies, this is almost always a focus of conversation because they, they haven't managed that transition where yeah. yes, it was an executive, it, that should be an executive level conversation at, at, at certain point in your life. Yeah. Um, but making plans early on to transition those relationships to CSMs or somebody else. Sometimes I even talk to folks who say, oh, the salesperson I talk to, they're my, my point of contact who I know if I go to yeah. is going to help me solve my problems and be successful. So sometimes it is somebody with a designated role like a CSM. Sometimes, you know, if you're the, the CEO of a large health system, you probably do expect to be able to talk to a, a C-level at your, your EMR vendor. Um, but it can, it can look a lot of different ways. And one of the things that I really like is when I see a vendor with a really high score here is we talk to them about why. They, what they share with us is that they're really focused on empowerment in all roles, exactly. regardless of whether or not they're customer facing or not. Because when all of those roles are empowered, um, within limits, of course, uh, that allows a CSM or salesperson or whoever that is that is the point of contact to more effectively solve problems because the rest of the organization uh, is aligned with them and is able to move quickly to solve problems. Absolutely. They're more effective and the time to solving the problem is decreased. When I see a high score with executive involvement, I know it's not a uh, vendor where the phrase, it's not my problem, that's not my job, I'll have to see if someone else can take care of it. That's not happening in conversations. Yes. Now there is one exception where we like to see very, very, very high executive involvement. Yes. Um, actually, there's two exceptions. Exception number one is um, we we really like to see this front of mind um, in, in, in services engagements. Yes. So up until this point, this is largely software, but anytime it is a, a service engagement that is highly strategic, um, there is a, an expectation that even if the executive, the C-level contact at the firm is, is not necessarily involved in all the conversation, uh, there's an expectation that they have that information and they can reach out. And often, depending on the nature of that um, engagement and how big it is and how complex it is, then executive will actually be involved. But Absolutely. that's an area where at least there needs to be a path to escalate there um, in some of the, so the examples of this might be 
um, if there is a you know digital transformation engagement, if it is looking at how to integrate all these different hospitals you just acquired into your existing health system, what the plan is there, that there's a little bit of a different expectation. The other thing that I see is uh, in turnaround stories um, where you have a low performing vendor who, you know, their score goes up, you know, overall score 10 points. Oftentimes executive involvement is very high and that's because the executives are there taking accountability for the challenges and really trying to let the clients know that this isn't just something we're saying, we're actually traveling to you, having webinars, however they're communicating that to get that executive in front of everybody. And that can be wonderful. The challenge then is if that is now the expectation and there isn't that that follow-up plan, like you said. How do you sustain yes, it? how do you sustain? Yes. So in turnarounds, we, we do actually like to see, we, we look at correlations between overall satisfaction and individual questions. This is one that uh, in turnaround scenarios, we actually like to see highly correlated but where we start to get worried is when that stays highly correlated. That's right. Post that transition and turnaround, because that oftentimes means that if that individual leaves, um, scores are going to drop because mm -hmm. it was a relationship not with the company, but with specific C levels, or the C level individual may have made a lot of promises that the organization can't actually fulfill on because the rest of the organization is actually not empowered to go do that. One of my favorite things that you talked about was having a plan or a map. Executive involvement is business continuity. You need to have a plan as you grow and you scale. You need to have a plan for what happens if something goes wrong. And having backup is really important so that you don't lose institutional knowledge or key people if they leave. Do you have someone in place who's ready to help your customers stay successful? Yes, so deep, big question, lots to unpack there. I don't wanna move on to our second question in this pillar, if there's anything really important that, that you see that you would want your vendors you work with to know outside of what we've already shared. I think some of the most powerful experiences I've seen as a CSM are when vendors get rough feedback about an executive involvement and the, the C-levels, the executives, they own it, they take accountability and they do webinars, they go and meet their customers at every location. They do um, Q and A sessions with me social media. Mm -hmm. When they own this metric in every step of the way, the reversals in the customer experience can be dramatic and they can be rapid too. But like you yes. said, can they sustain it? That's where Always the hard key. part is. The other area in relationship is a little more tactical in nature, um, and that is uh, the quality of phone and web support, which is is fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's really your ability to fully, emphasis on fully, resolve a, a problem for a customer in a timely manner. Yes. So one of the big mistakes that we sometimes see um, is in how this is measured. So I, I've worked with a few companies who had pretty decent cultures, good relationships, but the customer experience just felt a little off. And this was a question that was rated low mm -hmm. um, because the way that they were measuring success was just turnaround time for phone calls. How fast yep. were you closing tickets? But resolving those problems was not necessarily what they were measuring. And so they had great friendly people who were doing their best to help, but they were incented financially not to resolve problems, but to close tickets. I've run into the same thing where you'll see these lower scores and they're like, we have a ticketing system that is fantastic. That's wonderful. How long does it take to get a person on the phone or how long does it take from the initial reach out till the problem is solved? You get a much different story sometimes. Yes. Um, now this support question, we often use language like when you call in, but this also applies to, to web support as well. Absolutely. So one of the things that I sometimes see in the data is web support is, is valuable and helpful where I hear providers get frustrated with the web support specifically is when there is not an escalation path. So if web support isn't working, um, depending on perhaps how the contract was structured, they may not be able to, to reach out to somebody on the phone or they want to call, but they don't necessarily know who to call. So having, if you're going to have that be the first stop, having really clear escalation paths to the phone is sometimes where, where I see great support organizations falling down because that transition from one type of support to the other breaks down a little bit for the customer. Yeah, one area that I see as a common pain point is turnover. Mm -hmm. Making sure in your organization, if you have high turnover, then they have to re-educate someone over and over again about who am I? 
what's important to me. High turnover causes uh, providers to get nervous. And so doing things at your organization that can help reduce that and having a business continuity plan in place really goes a long way to helping people feel confident. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point that actually ties both of these questions together in many ways. Um, one of the things that we see is a, a statistically significant predictor of customer satisfaction is whether or not the vendor or software, or sorry, service firm um, has a really robust training plan internally, something that has teeth training. to it. So, yes. you know, I think most organizations hopefully have some kind of an onboarding or training plan, uh, but the difference is if it's something that is rigorous, that really requires those individuals to, to have some level of accountability and prove that they mm -hmm. can do that well and have the knowledge, that's something we see have a very significant impact. And that's not, that's not just phone and web support or, or CSMs, that can apply to lots of other roles, implementation, development, sales, et cetera. Yeah, training should never be an optional experience. That's like selling a car and offering the brakes is optional. Okay. Training has to be there. Well, yes, well, we'll be talking a lot more about training in, in future conversations, but um, I think that to sum up the, the relationship experience, I think that business continuity that you talked about, the level of empowerment that, that these groups, not just those that are customer facing, but those that would support those individuals have, as well as your ability to, to measure things that are relevant to the client's success, yes. you know, actually resolving problems as opposed to, not that you shouldn't look at times to close tickets, uh, but making sure that, that things are aligned to provider and customer outcomes, growth, success, not just what's best, what looks good on paper for the organization right. internally. Are you measuring the right metrics in the right way? Yes. Now, there is one more question in this pillar. So we talked about software, one more, and this is just for services. So we don't ask this in, in other contexts. And this is strength of partnership. This one is, is probably one of the one of the two questions I get the most um, inquiries about mm -hmm. when it comes to our, our services evaluation, which is, is a little bit different. You know, you yeah. don't need to measure delivery of new technology or ease of use if you're if, unless you know the, the person I'm working with is really difficult. So the ease of use is low, but we don't we don't ask that. And partnership is really looking at whether or not the firm in question here demonstrates that they have your interest at heart. Yes, and oftentimes there's this assumption that, well, that's really easy to do and be a partner if it's a really strategic type of engagement. If you're just doing outsourcing, you know, coding, et cetera, well, that's way more difficult. But I think that definition shows that it, it's, there are, it's not about whether or not you have tons of people on site talking all the time, having lots of these conversations, like you know, through CSM metrics that we've been talking about around some of the other questions, but there are ways to demonstrate that you do have their interest at heart even if it's something that is not strategic. So some examples that I see in the outsourcing world will be um, if there are, are, are gaps in performance where there is a, a solution or there might be a change in contract where mm -hmm. some of these other methods of proactive communication can come into play to help the customer feel supported and know that you care about their success. Um, one of the other common things that I see is vendors who hold themselves accountable to the customer's metrics. And that could either be just because that's what they want to do and so they keep track of that themselves, or that could be through some kind of a risk bearing agreement where we're gonna get these certain metrics. That's it's not always the case, yeah. but it really is, can you show that you care more about their long-term success rather than just checking the boxes of the scope of work? Yeah, no one wants to be a checkbox. <laughs> no. Uh, my husband, if he were here, would say, am I a checkbox? I promise if you're listening, I. I I never I'll be more off. available this weekend. It's been a very busy week. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the final thing that I wanted to mention, and curious to know if there's anything you would add, um, one of the challenges, because services is something where the, the bar is so high, it's easy to figure, not know how to get better scores here, especially if you're somebody who reads all the comments online and you go, well, these are all positive, yet I have a low strength of partnership score. W what am I supposed to do with that? One of my recommendations is as you go through that, anytime there's a description of an interaction or a relationship, a call, some kind of a meeting, anytime communication is happening, look at that and evaluate, is that something that is transactional or is that something where there, there was something deeper than that? So they returned my phone call in a timely manner is not the same as they're returning the phone calls and giving me great advice and insight. So transactional versus 
really strategic. And again, that strategy means something different in every single space. And I don't think I've come across a provider who's rating somebody for outsource coding who expects the same level of strategy you might get in a C-level transformational engagement. So providers are really good about understanding the scope of what to expect here. But if you can demonstrate that you have their interest at heart, we typically see pretty, pretty good scores in this area. So there's two phrases that make me nervous. And when I'm looking at scores like this and trying to understand what's going on, I look for these two phrases, cookie cutter approach mm. and one size fits all. Sometimes they can get, they can fulfill everything they're supposed to, but it's so regimented and there's no flexibility for the nuances of their customer. I've seen the a phrase cookie cutter, one size fit all, be the difference between a good score and a great score. Yes, building on that, the flip side of that is they really understand my needs, our organization, our goals. So I think that's a great tangible example of what would a, a transactional comment look mm -hmm. like versus something that really displays the partnership. Exactly, takes it to the next level. So there we have it. There we have it. Relationship. So important. Very, very important. Hopefully some, some good tips and tricks and ideas of how to interpret the, the data on the class website and some ideas hopefully of if you are struggling in some of these areas of what to do to move forward. Of course, if, if you are struggling in this area or it is an area of focus for you, please reach out to your CSM, the research director you work with. Um, we're saying very surface level right now, so it's broadly applicable, but yeah. lots of other detail we'd love to share. Yes, you. absolutely reach out. We're excited to talk to you.